try to make data control easier across the business for privacy use cases. So you may have seen us on LinkedIn or even in person at a recent IPP conference. And that's that's really part of the inspiration for this webinar. You know, we're coming to the end of 2023. We've spent a lot of time this year in the field at conferences with, um, with our customers in the field. And as far as buzzwords and 2023 trends, data map has really been at the top of the list. A lot of folks asking, what is it? Um, what are you all seeing within brands and businesses? And, and it's been a very buzzworthy term, not... Now, not that it can match generative AI, we, I think we all have to agree that's been the term of 2023, but data map is up there uh, for privacy pros. So we thought perfect opportunity to really debunk and demystify a lot of those questions and host a session really just about data mapping considerations for the privacy practitioner with some clear guidance and advice on how to approach projects, what you potentially need, um, how to evaluate vendors and more. So I'm really thrilled to have a great cross-functional panel joining me, all, me today for this conversation. So let's go ahead and dive into some intros. Uh, panelists would love for y'all to introduce yourself and say a little bit about you know what brings you to this conversation today. So let's start with you, Max. Awesome. Uh, hi everyone, my name is Max Anderson. I'm one of the co-founders of uh, Catch. I run the product organization. Um, I've been doing uh, software for, for quite some time now, but my background actually started more in the advertising and marketing uh, analytics side of the, of the house. Uh, so that certainly um, shows up in the way that we think about you know, product build out here at Catch and, uh, and the way we think about privacy as well. So looking forward to this conversation. Thanks, Max. Elisa? Sure. Welcome, everyone. I'm Elisa Hutnick. I chair Kelly Dry's Privacy Practice Group. And I work on the legal side, so I work both with companies who are looking to address state compliance efforts. I also represent companies who get investigated by the FTC or state attorneys general for their privacy compliance efforts. And I like to, to take at least those experiences and fold them right into the compliance advice as we're thinking about, you know, you're putting investing a whole lot of time and energy, making sure that you're you're rowing in the right direction. Great. Thanks, Elisa. And last but not least, Peter. Welcome, folks. My name is Peter. I'm one of the product folks here at Catch. Uh, my background comes more from a data infrastructure and data catalog side of the house. Um, I know, you know, the term data map has always been a little bit confusing between crossovers between various products that seem to have that functionality. So hopefully today we can talk about a little bit more and, and uh, clarify for folks what it is and what it isn't. Awesome. Thanks all. Well, let's go ahead and dive in. So just to review the agenda at the top, we've divided the discussion into four easy sections. Going to start with defining the data map, what it is, what it isn't, just kind of laying the land here. Then we'll get into how to start a successful data map project in your organization, things to think about, and then go right into the role of software, right? Like I mentioned, kind of debunk, demystify a lot of the, the hype and promises of what's out there when it comes to automation, what to ask, what to consider in your vendor evaluation. And then lastly, looking ahead, the data map beyond privacy. How can you think about it in the broader context of your organization beyond just the privacy program? So diving in, let's start with that basic question. What is a data map? Um, Max, I would love to ask you to start on this one because I, I love how you talk about this specifically in context of, you know, it's, it's a responsibility that deserves some empathy for whoever owns this internally at the customer or brand organization. So can you talk a little bit about your perspective there? Oh, Max, you're muted. Excellent. You would think I know how to use a computer by now. Uh, I actually think that the, it's a terrible name. It's a, it's a great name, but it's, it's a very generic term, right? The words data followed by map could mean anything to anyone. Um, so depending on where you're coming from, you might hear that term and think, uh, if you're an IT professional, you, you might certainly think of something radically different than you know, folks who are steeped in the compliance side of the business uh, think about when they're, when they're using that word. Um, I tend to look at it through the lens of the problem that I think people who uh, work in the compliance uh, side of the business are, are trying to solve. And so if you, I have frequently tried to imagine what I would do if I were told by my manager, here's the good news, you now own privacy for, you know, a 20,000 employee organization and how that would um, make me react. And, and frankly, it's fear. Uh, because th there's there's a huge expectation that you know a bunch about what the business does, um, what information they have, 
what ongoings, uh, what data projects, who's who within the organization, all to assess risk. And, and you're the one holding the bag for, you know, putting your stamp of approval on whether or not the, the data practices of a business are ultimately going to um, bring any scrutiny or, or harm to the organization and its brand. And that's frankly terrifying, juxtaposed to the lack of knowledge you may have as you started out. So when I think about the data map, I think of it as the cornerstone or the starting point of the privacy program. How do you even answer those questions or evaluate any of these weighty, heady topics without just a core systematic understanding of like, what are the assets under management and what's going on here? Um, so that's how I think of data map at the most conceptual level. Mm -hmm. It's so interesting that something is both the cornerstone of the privacy program, but also has so many different definitions or understandings around it. Alisa, what do you hear the most from your customers and how do you try to advise on it, what it is? Uh, you know, it, it's the holy grail from our perspective, because if a company has it, then everything else is a whole lot easier, right? You can advise, you have to do deletion, right? Well, you know where the data is. And ultimately, if you have a data map, it's easier to facilitate that conversation on why you're using it. So, I mean, I think it's in some ways like the eye, in the eye of the beholder, right? Like, what's your purpose? What problem are you trying to solve, as Max said? Um, and if you have a data map, that's really all the information you need to kind of go right to it's like your fast pass to to the answers. Um, I will tell you, realistically, not that many companies have one, right? It's really thorny. And I think because of that, there's all sorts of ideas about what it is. And like a lot of things in the privacy world, aligning on a common understanding about things is so critical because I feel like we spend a lot of time just walking in circles. So and so thinks it's one thing, we think it's another. Whereas, you know, the the data map, I think, is it's a really important tool to just align. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think a helpful place to start when we think about it is maybe what isn't it? And Peter, you have this great catalog background. Can you take us through some of these other common terms we hear related to data map, but maybe aren't data map? Yeah, absolutely. I think one of the first things that people think about just by the virtue of the name data map, when you say that to, let's say someone from a data engineering background, they immediately think about things like data lineage, right? Oh, uh, so you mean uh, what what, <clears throat> what my tools are doing, extracting data and then transforming it and putting it somewhere? That's that's data map, right? Um, not, not quite. Um, you know, first of all, I think the data map definition is much broader than that. It's It's not just a you know, oh, my data landed in Snowflake, then here's how it gets transformed, and here's landed in this table. It's, uh, it needs to know, um, you know, your data came from, you know, SaaS tools like HubSpot or Marketo. Then it gets loaded into this system, and then what are the uh, PIs that are being transferred and handled between those systems? All of that information isn't captured in automated data lineage, right? Um, the other part of, of this discussion is around, you know, okay, now, if, if we have uh, a little bit of data lineage, but then also system registry, is that sufficient for data? Again, it typically is, is not sufficient um, because one, for the system registry, um, a lot of it is dealing with the known knowns. In an ideal world, when somebody is building out this um, data map, they would have some ability to figure out what are other systems that are not currently on my radar, right? Um, maybe my customer's interacting with a new marketing tool that the marketing team deployed, but we have, uh, from, from a privacy perspective or even from a data perspective, they weren't even aware of that. So there are all these blind spots to a classic system registry that makes it a little bit dangerous to even start at um, from a data map perspective. And finally, we have the notion of data catalogs, right? Oh, well, what are ways that we can uh, figure out, uh, deploy a data catalog and figure out where data are in the organization? Um, I think data catalog can be a good start to data map. But again, many data catalogs are missing that critical piece of third-party SaaS apps, right? If, if the data is in uh, Marketo, if it's in Adobe, uh, typically a data catalog do not cover those uh, uh, the data residing in those SaaS systems. And at the same time, um, a lot of data catalogs can be focused around, you know, the business definition, but they generally lack the rigor of a true um, a record of processing activity, right? For data maps to work, your organization really needs to have an idea of here are the processing activities I'm using these set of PI for, and 
and having that available to the regulators. Awesome. Thanks, Peter. So helpful to just kind of lay that land there. So thinking about what is the data map now, let's look at this visual. And Max, I'd love for you to kind of start walking us through this when you are looking at data map considerations. Yes. Uh, first of all, apologies for the eyesore. Um, there's a lot of, there's a lot here. Um, some of it taken from, you know, I think anyone here who's, who's done their reading is going to look at this and, and see there's a lot of influence from GDPR's ICO recommendation, but I think that, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, um, how does a data map exist in the context of different regulatory climates? Is it different? Is it the same? We'll get to that, but I, I think the, the number one thing that I try to use this diagram to um, illustrate is that a data map has two key kind of artifacts that intersect or have connection to one another. Um, it's all about, you know, we talked about registry. Peter said, yeah, it's not just a system registry, right? Because the other really important part is what are you doing with the data? You can call it a processing activity. You can call it whatever you want. Um, and the level of detail can be subject to how your business uh, defines, you know, the rational level of detail, but some context around what you're using the information for is super, super important. Uh, and that's why when we say, you know, what's not a data map, we talk about frequently, you know, data catalogs, we talk about lineage in the context of maybe that's a level of detail that's a little bit too low. Do you want to get to a higher level uh, ambition there? But um, when we think about what data, there's a lot of information about the data itself, right? Whose data? The subject type, you might call it. Um, what categories of information or, you know, personal information does that data fall into? Where does it come from? Um, where is it physically stored, right? Um, and, and that stuff you can always get in the context of a processing activity because data lives where it lives. So separating the what you're collecting and where it lives and attributes about those from the what you're doing with it is a super important, I think, uh, paradigm that at least we bring to, to this particular conversation. Technical safeguards, uh, retention schedule and proof that you're enforcing that retention schedule, obviously important. And then on the what it is you're doing with data side, uh, of course, for what purpose, uh, I like that. Um, I'm, I'm a big fan of you know, GDPR. It, that's where I cut my teeth. So I'm, 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 I'm biased to some of those concepts, but I think they transcend different regulatory climates. Um, there's a lot of information that helps in the context of organizational dynamics, like what teams, uh, what business departments, those are the people that you need to have close relationships with. So just being able to categorize and understand it from that dimension is important. And then, of course, assessments about what it is that you're doing, right? Does it make sense? What's the risk involved? Are there uh, remediations or are there some sort of controls that you want to put in place, mitigants, whatever you want to call them, but a whole document store that reflects your analysis of what it is that's being done with data and your attestations that it does make sense or what risk you might flag in the mitigants uh, around those risks. Uh, and lastly, the, the kind of legal justifications for why you're doing that particular thing with data. You may need consent. You may not, but having some clear position as to why you do or don't or what it is that you're, you know, using to legally justify your processing is, a, is, a, is, a, is an important consideration for what you're doing with data. That's kind of how I think about it. Uh, hopefully the diagram doesn't give anyone with a trypophobia too much uh, angst here. Thanks, Max. That's so helpful. As you talk through it, it really comes to mind for me just the need to... Um, recall from an ownership perspective that you're not in it alone, right? This is not a one person job and it's gonna require so much collaboration across the org. Totally. Mm -hmm. Great, well, let's dive into that. Uh, so now that we have this foundation here, I'd love to start talking about um, the inputs for map, map success, right? Um, and I think we had some great chats leading up to this conversation, Max, Lisa, Peter, about critical inputs really regardless of format, right? Whether it's, um, in Excel, in a software tool, there's some basic um, foundational elements that we need to start with. So Max, again, I'd love for you to take us through here how you think about these critical inputs. <laughs> sure. Um, I've seen, and this is, again, I'm, I, I sell software for a living, right? So my perspective is, is somewhat warped um, in the sense that I, I see projects from the perspective of people who have a lot of these things and then people who don't. And I see a very different level of success. So this comes from my perspective that, look, you, you can you can buy software all you like, but it's not gonna solve your entire problem. So you're gonna need some amount of leadership buy-in that's gonna ultimately facilitate 
your collaborative kind of parties across the organization. So that's the box number two, right? Um, no software is going to give you a silver bullet solution to where you don't have to talk to the colleagues in your organization. And it is going to take time. It is going to take investment. Developers are probably going to have to do things like deploy machinery to go scan for information in the, you know, in the, in the infrastructure that you, you maintain. All that requires leadership and, and practitioner support. Um, and then the last thing that I would call out briefly here is some sort of a strategy and a roadmap for success. Um, this can easily become what I call an ocean boiling exercise. It's perfection is unattainable. This, this should be viewed from the perspective of a, a journey and a risk-based approach. I hear that a lot from the people who've schooled me in, in kind of privacy terms, um, but it's, it's super important, right? If you have one person working on this project, you're not gonna get perfection if you have thousands of, of data repositories. So you have to decide what is it that I'm actually going to call a first version? What are the questions I'm going to answer? Um, can I elicit early what are the top 10 most you know, high risk areas to go investigate and make that the most important thing I do first? If, if you don't have a sense of that, um, what ends up happening is you get frustrated, you start to fail, and you never push anything out. You don't get a first version. And I think that's the worst place to be. You have nothing to show for all the hard work that you've done. And of course, as a software vendor, you know, that can also create tensions in the relationship with your customers. So I always try to, and our CX team tries to really make this an important part of the, okay, now you've bought software, or maybe you haven't, but what's your plan? What are we actually going to go try and accomplish? Thanks, Max. Can you spend more time on that when, where you're seeing people get hung up on the process? I feel like we've heard that from customers before where they got started on a project and just you know, the, the, the wheel started spinning in a certain place in the project. So just dive into that more. What, what are I think examples? Number one, uh, at least for me, I think the number one place people get stuck is in the discovery side. Um, that they, they tend to spend inordinate amounts of time, I mean, on the order of years, deploying solutions that are going to scan and map and well, map, scan and surface in some UI. Uh, the existence of a column or an attribute in a file that, uh, that may or may not be personal, you know, and, and you spend years doing that in some cases. And as we discussed earlier, that's not a data map, that's the registry. And, and it's interesting and it's useful and it lends itself to the, the secondary tertiary uh, kind of activities within the privacy program. But goodness, I, I would be pretty... Um, underwhelmed if, if, if I spent two years of my life toward an objective and, and, and that was all I'd done, what I would consider a prerequisite ingredient to the final outcome. So I think people really struggle with making clear decisions about how much am I gonna discover or back to the kind of roadmap and strategy, like what are the 10 most important places I'm gonna go hit and I'm gonna produce an end-to-end -end version and then I'm gonna dig deeper and I'm just gonna make that a cyclical pattern as opposed to, First, I do discovery, and I spend three and a half years on that. Oh, but it's out of date, and I'm going to start it over again. And like, ah, there's there's other things you should go do. That's where I see the most uh, the most pain and, and, and struggle. Yeah, at least I see a lot of head nodding from you. Oh, what would you? Add? Yeah, because uh, I've just seen that so much. Like I see it's who's the unlucky person in legal who got tagged to to leave the effort on the data map. Usually, it's because they need to update the privacy policy, and it's a whole lot of interviews starts with, right? And I think Max's point on, it's a risk-based approach, but it's also be realistic. How much time do you have and what is the deliverable? By when do you need that deliverable? And what are you going to do with that deliverable? Because if it's to support and inform, for example, like some of the state compliance efforts, then I would want to prioritize, right? What is so critical in terms of the type of data that I really need to orient my efforts because you can absolutely spend three years. Um, you know, this is this is the fabric of the company in terms of what data you have, where everything is dynamic. It's not a point in time. I mean, it is a point in time. It's not static. And so really aligning beginning and end timing and budget. And then to the point in terms of leadership buy-in, we see things shut down when, because marketing team's busy. They're trying to hit revenue goals. Like they don't have time for you or InfoSec, like you can't even get them to respond to your email because they don't need you for that. You need something from them. And so it's both a, 
kind of social science relationship building, uh, but also absolutely kind of what is that earlier investment to make sure you've got the leadership support and what does that translate into in terms of so that people aren't surprised, they know what it is, um, you're not annoying them, they know why it's really critical and again, you've prioritized it. So that way you've got a deliverable that relevant folks can actually see why it is relevant to the, the needs of the business. Mm -hmm. And it seems like with that leadership buy-in, if you're doing a project and then you get hung up and you're spinning, then you get stuck in a vicious cycle with maybe you, you've lost some leadership support, right? If you've, if you've stalled. Yeah. I mean, I'll just, I'm, I beat a dead horse on this. If you come at it that it's a compliance need, it's really hard to get support. It just isn't. It's not going to sell it. If you come at this on at as to how you'll be able to better use data and you will get time back because you'll be able to make this action on decisions more, right? You'll be able to support the marketing. Things aren't going to get stuck. I just think it's a lot easier for the business to see why it's a priority and to put um, allocate time and resources behind that effort. Mm -hmm. So some education there, yeah. Talking with marketing, talking with IT, helping them understand what they could get out of it. So then you know how to report on things beyond compliance checkboxes. Yeah. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. I think at the end, we've got a little bit of time allocated to, you know, what are the other, you know, benefits of the data map. And I think there's, there's quite a bit that might help uh, on the internal sale of the, of the project. Great. All right. Well, let's move on. So, once we've got these three inputs for data max success, we might start thinking about formats, right? How do we want this to look? And software could be an appropriate solution. Um, so Peter, lead us off here. What are some signs we maybe should think about investing in software that it could be worth the investment? Yeah, absolutely. So I think the first thing is, you know, if you already tried data, um, manual data projects and it didn't quite work out, I think that's probably a big sign that, you know, maybe some software would, would help. Um, I think, you know, there are some organizations, maybe small e-commerce stores where there's just very little change and also very little systems where a manual data map might actually work for you, right? In that case, uh, probably, you know, you're, you're, you're probably fine running with a manual um, a data map. But if you have an organization that is any, any, any time larger than that, uh, and that there are constant changes to the data that's being brought in, as well as the processing activities that you're doing, I think that's that's where you're going to see a lot of bang for your buck in terms of having a software to help you uh, build it, build out that framework, and to automate what it can, and also help you orchestrate what it can't between different people. Um, so yeah, which kind of goes to the second point where a lot of the challenges of the data map is that it's kind of an ongoing work, right? It's not just oh I've I've done this once, then it's 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 that way forever. Um, it's very much that if, if, if there are changes in organization, your data map needs to keep up with that change. Um, and typically that buy-in is super important, right? Well, we heard earlier from uh, Max and Lisa, not only the buy-in from uh, executive team, but also buy-in from practitioners. This is a highly cross-functional um, activity. So, uh, you know, both from the privacy perspective, both from the data engineering and the, and, and the analytics perspective, you want to have multiple people brought, uh, bought in to make sure that, hey, if, if let's say marketing owns the system, that they're able to say, well, this is the person who owns it and that he, uh, they are able to then uh, say what, what PI is processed and for what purpose. Um, and then finally, you know, if you want to have your data map being more useful than just a compliance tool, like uh, Alyssa mentioned earlier, um, a lot of the, the software tools are going to be able to help you understand not only uh, what are your privacy obligations, but potentially even help you kickstart your um, sort of data governance initiatives uh, around how we can better use that data, things around operational efficiencies, around what data is like not being used, or there are a lot of costs associated with holding these data, both from a risk perspective and also a physical storage perspective that you may want to reconsider. So all, all in all, to say that you know, uh, having a data map software can really help if you feel like your project is a little more complex than just the very basic manual data map and that there are changes as well as cross team functionalities involved. I think the one thing I would add to that though, is if you look at this list, um, all of these to me feel like things that happen after you have executive or, you know, leadership buy-in, right? 
the number of people that are working on the project is a good signal for uh, some amount of buy-in. Um, the fact that your output is going stale means you're rigorously uh, you know, attending to the quality of something you've already done. That's tremendous effort in and of itself. Um, you've done, like I said, you've done this multiple times. Now you're looking for reporting or some of these benefits that come from having a high quality data map that may not be just core to the, the privacy program. Um, all those indicate a relative, uh, a relatively mature organization who's been at this a little while. And my, I, I don't intend for the folks on the line to be listening and having the takeaway that oh, I shouldn't do this unless I do it manually first. I think you can start with software, but I don't think you're going to be successful unless, again, as we described in the prior slide, you've figured out exactly what success looks like for you within the context of your business and its constraints and its objectives. Great. Well said. Thanks, Max. So if you are reading this and kind of some of these are resonating with you, thinking that maybe this does fit your organization, We've put together some questions that you may want to think about as you're starting a evaluation of vendors. Like I mentioned, we've been to a lot of, selfishly at Catch, we've been to a lot of IAPP conferences this year. Everyone is talking about the data map. So I think really important for you to be able to start with um, where you sit when it comes to your priorities and requirements. So Max, we'd love for you to start taking us through questions you should be able to answer as you're starting a vendor eval. Yes. This is important. Um, breadth versus depth, I think, is a super important uh, consideration here. I, I think maybe it ties a little bit to the, the places I've seen people get hung up when they're looking to scan every nook and cranny of the enterprise before they do anything else. Um, and, 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 and of course, the quality of those you know, scans. So you could say, yeah, yeah, I know there's a database here, or I know that there's this third-party SaaS app, and I can give you, you know, 80% confidence that it's probably got, you know, jalopies inside or whatever it may be. Um, but if, if the bar for success in the organization is, and, and there's plenty of companies that are reasonable in asking for this, is 100% perfection uh, across 100% of the assets, that's just something to be eyes open about, right? You need to know that that's the bar, or you need to know that the bar is, I actually need to first get coverage and then quality at 60%, and then I can move forward. Because uh, that sort of decision um, certainly changes the way you think about both vendor and supplements to vendor. Because I can assure everyone on this call, no matter what vendor you select, there will be points of frustration given where that vendor has chosen to invest its, its you know, engineering time to solve various elements of this problem. Make no mistake, this is an extraordinarily difficult problem to solve. And, and a, at, a, at a quality bar that I think the market wants. Um, the other thing I'd say is where does your data live? Another good driver of, of kind of vendor discourse is, um, you know, is are you, I work with companies that have over a thousand SaaS applications that they use. Um, and, you know, they've got a few internal database technologies that they use, but they primarily run their business on SaaS. Um, that's going to drive a very different vendor conversation than a company that is a tech startup that does 99% of their data processing uh, internally and only a subset of, or, you know, a limited amount through their marketing team, which might use three SaaS tools. And then, you know, the last element of this is, yeah, of course, everyone's got, you know, Google Drive or, you know, the Microsoft suite, some sort of a file system where collaboration happens. Um, but then there are other companies that have, like, primarily the work product is through documents. And so the scanning is very important at the, you know, we'll call this unstructured for now. Um, it's very important for those types of, of businesses. And that will also drive your decision making for software, right? If it's, if it's primarily documents, maybe e-discovery is an interesting category to evaluate. Um, the, the point I'm making here is where your data lives will help you um, produce the, the types of questions that you're going to need to ask of the vendors when you're in your evaluation mode. Um, and then the last thing is, at least from my perspective, like what problem are you trying to solve? <laughs> where, do you, where do you emphasize your needs of the tool? Um, I talk to a lot of people who are like, yeah, man, just help me get, get the export and I just need to go back to business. And that's fine. 
Um, but I also talk to people who are like, no, I did all this hard work to get all this really interesting information there. Now I want to interrogate the information because I have you know, extra questions or additional activities that I need to do from my program. Can you tell me which systems meet these criteria, but in these last instances haven't had some sort of a check-in? I want to prioritize those for, you know, for work that I'm going to go do. Um, that type of uh, workflow process is super important to some people, but it's a different software product or a different set of features within a software product. Um, collaboration, I would say, is the last interesting thing to consider. Like, do you want to run your program on the tool or do you want your tool to aid you in running your program? And I guess what I mean by that is, it's, to me, the gold standard is, is a product that actually facilitates collaboration. Um, it, it, it invites the practitioners in, it allows for dialogue, um, mutual understanding, it allows for action items to be done by people and the accounting and tracking for those people doing or not doing those action items. That to me feels like a, a product that facilitates the program as opposed to an artifact that is an input to the program where the rest of the program happens outside of the tool itself. Um, I see all sorts of different types of, of de you know, demands or needs, um, but these are the types of questions I think help drive a good vendor selection before you go into the RFP process. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Max. Elisa, any other things you hear from your clients as far as what you, you recommend they ask um, before they start? Well, I think the questions that Max raised are, are really just on point. Uh, again, there's this like idealized data map with everything wrapped in a bow that a lot of buyers go into it thinking. And so they're not even getting to some of these flavors and the fact that your data map, it's really going to depend on what you need, what, what's that deliverable. And so I think these kinds of questions um, are really critical and the answers by the vendors are also really critical um, because if you have some vendors who are very rigid, they have one type and that's the only type. And so as your questions go to the experience, right? Like walk me through, if I were to use your software, what is the experience? If you find that there's only a one size fits all approach, I mean, we just talked about the enormous investment of time uh, and effort and output. If, if you, you have to fit it into that one uh, block, like that's not gonna work. And I think it, sometimes a lot of the buyers, when you have this idealized impression of what you need, you don't get into the weeds on what would it be like to do a data map using your software and really find like strengths and weaknesses um, because they all have them. And I think it's really finding what's gonna be the best fit for your need and your priorities and having a good sense of what would a deliverable with all these factors in mind look like with vendor A versus vendor B versus vendor C. I think you can make yourself a lot more of an in informed decision in terms of finding your right partner. I'm desperate to make another point. I'm so sorry. Uh, but I do, I do think that the number one most um, seemingly non-discussed attribute of an evaluation is, uh, is, is the type of company you want to work with. And look, this, the privacy space is new. There are a lot of up-and-comers. There are some established folks. But even in the context of privacy, established means started in like, what, 16, maybe? Um, that's very new. Um, and so I think it's important for when companies evaluate or, or go into the process of, of buying, they decide what are the attributes of the organization that are leading indicators to a partnership that makes sense. Because if you're going in expecting Happy Meal software that's perfection at its finest um, right out the gate, I'm sure that somebody is going to tell you that. I I'm certain of it, but, but I'm, I'm here to tell you that once you get into the into the thick of it, it's it's just not that simple because the problem is hard and the software is built for 30 cases and you're 31. Um, and so all these vendors are working hard to try to meet the needs of, of these types of, of issues, but it's important to understand whether or not you're willing to take that risk, right? Again, back to success in the program. Um, if you don't if you don't feel like it's important to have a vendor that is going to go to the mat and, and roadmap and co-innovate with you. But that's totally fine because uh, you're going to have more, perhaps it might seem more stable to go with an established vendor. And that's, there's nothing wrong with that. But understanding where your sensitivities are, um, how the vendor shows up in RFP and accommodating your requests, those all are, are signals to 
how much they want to work with you now and how much they're going to work for you once you sign. Uh, and I think that's, that's an important consideration and you should decide what your risk tolerance is and what you really care about before going into the RFP process. Absolutely. So we have to go back to the debunking, right? What can you do? What can't you do? What's really possible with software? Um, Max, keep us going here. What's what's the real deal? Let's let's walk through some of these items. Yeah, I, I always hate being the arbiter of truth because look, innovation's a, a real thing, right? And and it's not to say that um, what I know or what I believe is is the end all be all by any means. But what I do think is is a healthy dose of pragmatism for people who I, I frequently interact with. Um, more of the privacy program folks. Uh, and we, we get into the, you know, the IT teams and data teams, marketing teams that come in later, but um, primarily we get in, you know, the, the initial conversations are with uh, folks that I, I may not be as experienced with technology and, and don't know um, what they don't know. And so the thing I hate the most is, is feeling like there's, there's deception in the, in the sales process or in the types of things that can happen. Um, and I think it creates misleading, you know, expectations that don't um, foot the bill. So I'm, I'm hoping to just rattle off a few things that I've heard um, that that are definitely, you know, magic silver bullets to a degree, but then some things that I don't know for me, based on what I've seen, don't necessarily pass the sniff test. Uh, so with that, you know, you see a list here. Look, um, unstructured data discovery is possible. Let's all just have a moment and agree that Look, we've done it, it's doable. I think the question is cost. Um, for example, if you look at um, Microsoft Priva, uh, awesome product that, that basically does the, the data deletion on your uh, unstructured data sets within the Microsoft ecosystem. There's a reason it costs $200 a DSR. Um, and it's not to put Microsoft on blast, it's, it's, it's to fundamentally recognize that what the, the, the infrastructure costs to go solve that problem is, extraordinary and juxtaposed you know the privacy space today having a relatively low price point perspective um yeah it's possible uh do you want to do you really want to spend to solve that problem it's one one consideration and lastly to what end to the point i was trying to make earlier do you need somebody to tell you that there's probably personal information on your you know uh, within your unstructured drive google drive whatever you want to call it of course there is how risky is it you know, I'm not trying to diminish the problem. I'm just trying to make sure that I at least color the dialogue with what problem are you trying to solve? And by and large, um, we, we frequently see people want to do this because they want to know where to go delete data. And what we've seen in the ecosystem is that both Google and Microsoft have shown up with tools to make that not a third party vendor selection, but a native uh, application of the, of the tools themselves. Uh, data discovery, I'll try to kick it along. I know we don't have much time. Uh, <laughs> Just discovery, both in third-party SaaS apps and kind of data platforms like Snowflake, et cetera, very, very possible. Classification is super possible. The caveats to classification are, for every single question you want to have answered, you need a model. People overlook that. Um, it's not unbounded. It's a very fixed set of, I think this is a hot dog. I think this is a smartphone. And so for every single question you want to answer, there's basically a model for it. And so there, there are limitations to how broad, this is back to my breadth first step uh, point, that the classification is gonna, is gonna you know, yield results. Um, residency, prioritization of work, uh, there are clever ways to do that uh, within software. Um, human workflow and collaboration, we've all worked with tools that do awesome at this, I think that's important. Uh, the quick points on limitations, magical auto data flow maps, that is not realistic uh, and as far as I'm concerned. It's probably possible, but extraordinarily cost prohibitive. Um, and the main reason for that is your data ecosystem is not limited to one tool. It's Snowflake and it's Redshift and it's Postgres and it's MailChimp and Amplitude and HubSpot and all these different tools that you use, some magical lens that's going to scan what uh, to, to produce the twos and fro's. Again, some limitations, some abilities, but I think what the buyer shows up with in their mind um, and a tool's ability to do that, I think they're very at odds on this particular subject. Um, knowledge of the business context, forget about it, right? Your, your risk profile, what you do with data, your business objectives, which are 
part and parcel fundamentally relevant for this exercise are not just knowable by a machine through some scan. So I think that's an important thing to, to just embrace and recognize as you go into this process. Um, auto filling out of assessments, again, risk is so subjective. There's supposed to be real substantive analysis that goes on. And that's, I think, you know, I don't think the machine is intended to replace that for now, um, maybe in some future day, but I, I haven't seen the machinery get to that place. So I think it's better to think about the software and its ability to aid you as the practitioner to a point where you can do substantive analysis. Because what I see most of the time is people spend 90% of their time data munging or trying to collate facts before they do analysis, as opposed to actually doing the analysis itself. Um, and yeah, I think this idea of magical risk scores, I've seen the software industry show up with like beautiful charts that red, yellow, green, and everything just looks like super, it's, you know, awesome. But I, I've never seen the implementation paradigm behind those um, be anything other than underwhelming. Uh, so magical risk scores for your business seem a little bit far out of reach from, from my perspective. But again, uh, if you found the magic bullet, um, that, that's okay too. There's just no magic bullet, is there? <laughs> I don't believe in it, but uh, I'm also a skeptic, a little bit of a pessimist. And, uh, we'll leave it there. <laughs> <laughs> All right, some more vendor considerations. Max, I love what you went through earlier on just making sure your vision aligns to the vendor's vision that you select. And uh, Alisa, you are a seasoned pro in this young data privacy space. Um, thinking about what you've seen from just different software vendors and how folks have matured, how, how do you think about advising your customers to kind of map their vision to the vendor vision? Well, I mean, particularly given how fast the laws are changing and new laws are getting added, I think it's so important that your partner can it can be nimble. Um, I think where we've seen some who are just so rigid, like this is the way it is. This is their template. If you want to change, that's 12 months from now. Um, that's that's just not a satisfactory answer. And I think, you know, you're balancing names, but also like what's the problem you're trying to solve bringing on this vendor? And so I just would highly encourage pressure testing that to, Ma to Max's point, like, this vendor is going to be helping you. You're going to be in the trenches with the vendor. Um, is that vendor responsive? Do you have people? Would you have people with that vendor who are going to work with you on your experience? Or is that person kind of going to not return your phone calls? Um, I say this because I hear this, um, where I've got clients trying to chase down for like well beyond months uh, the, the vendor contact. And I just think that's unacceptable. Mm hmm. Completely. Yes. I love it, John. For every complicated problem, there's a simple and elegant solution and it's wrong. <laughs> Max, that sounds like something you'd like. <laughs> yeah. I love it. <laughs> awesome. Well, we're coming up on the end here. Um, looking ahead, l let's end with a little uh, roundtable here. If I can ask each of you to just share, you know, thinking about the data map beyond privacy and just applications to just improving the business as a whole. Um, what are you excited about or where do you think there's value? Um, Peter, why don't you kick us off? Sure. I think one of the interesting things is around like the idea of risk, right? I think this exercise really, really forces you to put in front, like, what are the data that I'm collecting? Where do they live in the systems? And hopefully are they being used, right? Um, I think the whole idea of like, uh, quote unquote, dark data or data that you're storing, but really has very little organizational value. It's been talked about in the context of data engineering and data operations, as well as from a privacy perspective um, in, in the context of like data minimization, right? Um, so I do think data map is an excellent way to get a start on that effort. Um, and, you know, uh, hopefully software vendors will be able to come out with better uh, tooling to help uh, automate that process. Awesome. Thanks, Peter. Elisa, what's top of mind for you? Uh, the customer experience. I think uh, so many of so many of my clients have been limited in customer preferences, right? Whether they opt in, they opt out, because um, they had different vendors doing different things, right? Texting was one vendor, email was one, and they didn't have that full surf, just a, their arms around the data in order to be able to actually surf, have a really good user experience for the customer. And I think 
where data mapping can really flow into not just compliance, but back to experience, which I do see it doing a lot more efficiently. I think it's just better for everyone. It's better for the company. It's better for its brand trust. It's better for the consumer at the end of the day. Absolutely. Well said. Max, take us home. Uh, well, I put pressure for something profound, but uh, look, it's a lot to assemble a data map. So uh, for me, I, I would love a world where it's not just a report, but it's, you know, it's an active knowledge base and collaboration tool for the most important thing that a business, you know, cares about driving its business forward with, which is data. Um, so to the degree that we can all kind of mind shift to a place where, yeah, collaboratively across the disciplines, uh, data practitioners are going to show up because there's benefit to them in the output of a data map, right? Like I can tell you as a product manager, um, the last company that I had uh, joined, I, I remember reading the wiki and trying to um, understand the flow of information and the different use cases on top of the various flows of information, just so I could do my job better. Um, if I'm an analyst and I want to explore the like e-commerce for you know data consumption, um, that's a use case and it lends itself nicely to the prerequisite or the ingredients that go into a data map. There's quite a bit of utility that I can think of that um, transcends the, the compliance and privacy organization. But it's, of course, contingent upon um, buy-in and, and, and the actual willingness to make this accurate and, and, and a real source of, of, of information about the data ongoings of the business. So, mm -hmm. Awesome. Thanks. Oh, I see we got one question. Elisa, thanks for taking it in the chat. Appreciate it. Anything you'd want to add? Uh, I mean, these are super sensitive. So even with like your data security, I think about that from breaches. We we had to do that. This is highly sensitive. It's a really important investment. I think it equals data strategy, really, right? If you know all your data and you know where it is and why it's being used and all the relevant stakeholders, that's your strategy. You don't give that up. Awesome. Thanks. All right. Well, I know we're up at time. Thank you, Elisa, Max, and Peter for joining us. And then most importantly, thank all of you for, for listening in. Really a pleasure to have this chat today. All of you will receive uh, the recording and copy of the slides via email. And of course, if you want to talk more about this, uh, the Catch team would love to chat. Uh, if you want to bend our ear, talk more about the data map or whatever challenges you're facing, please just uh, reply to our email or send us a note. So with that, thank you all and have a wonderful day. Thanks for joining us. Thanks. Thank you.